of uh, projectile that was used in Judea, in Israel, uh, you're looking for a very specific size and shape, a nice smooth oval shape. This improves the aerodynamic nature of the projectile, maximizing accuracy. You need a certain amount of weight to get the projectile to stay in the pouch of the sling happily. If it's too light, it will just fall out as you swing the sling back. If it's too heavy, it won't go as fast when you shoot it. So between those parameters is the ideal uh, sling stone. He chose five smooth stones from the stream and with his sling in his hand, approached the Philistine. Now we have a sling and a stone like the one David himself would have held, we can test this weapon's capabilities. Luis Pons Livermore is the slinging champion of the Balearic Islands, home for millennia to the world's greatest slingers. The Balearic Islands get this reputation of being the best slingers in the ancient world. They get an inherited expertise in using the sling. Luis has traveled to the Holy Land to test the destructive power of a replica Iron Age woolen sling and stone. He is investigating the exact technique David himself would have used to bring down Goliath. The sling is like an extension of the arm. It has three sections. One ring is here, and then there's the middle part where the stone goes. It ends in a knot here. You put your middle finger in here, and you hold it in a pinch, not a grip. The stone is put in the top part of it. You simply spin it three times, stretch your arm, and open your hand. The snap heard from a sling is a sonic boom. So much power is released that the end of the sling actually breaks the sound barrier. Luis has erected a nine-foot Goliath target, whose forehead is represented by a load cell, a device that measures impact. It is only 4.6 square inches in area, equivalent to the region of Goliath's forehead that was not protected by armor. The device will tell Luis just how much force would have hit Goliath's skull. So for a missile the size and shape of a sling bullet, how much force needs to be exerted in order to kill? If we're talking about how much force that is necessary to kill somebody by an impact to the brain, anything over 3,000 newtons spread over an area of 30 millimeters squared is enough to kill a human being. A shockwave goes through the brain and causes the brain to strike the inside of the brain case, irreversibly damaging the brain tissue uh, to such an extent that it, it couldn't work again. 3,000 newtons, or 3 kilonewtons, is equivalent to the force necessary to smash a concrete block in half. Luis readies his sling for the test. The target is tiny, equivalent to the only area of Goliath's forehead that was not protected by armor. Three point six two kilonewtons. That's sufficient to eliminate Goliath with a sling and a stone. Goliath is now dead. He slung it and struck the Philistine on the forehead. The stone sank into his forehead and he fell face down on the ground. But to have achieved this must have taken extraordinary skill and nerve. Even Luis, the world's foremost champion slinger today, has found it exceptionally difficult to obtain power and accuracy at the same time. To be able to take out an armored man with one sling stone is uh, a lucky or an incredibly skillful shot, even for a very skilled slinger. He must have been endowed with some tremendous skill, ability and capability that came to fore at the time of a crisis. And the fact that he was able to face a crisis successfully is one of the basic requirements for ultimate kingship. Ancient discoveries have revealed that it is possible for a mere boy to sling a stone so accurately that he could kill a distant target. But to do this, David would have been more skilled than the average shepherd boy in the arts of a warrior, or very lucky, or as the Bible suggests, truly blessed. Throughout the reign of King David, and still to this day, man has attempted to control fire. 
Could ancient documents reveal that the people of biblical times had a miraculous technique, a way to create fire as if from nowhere? One of the Bible's most mysterious wonders is the story of an altar of stone and wood described in 1 Kings. The altar burst into a fiery inferno, but amazingly no spark was used to ignite it. The flame appeared to spring from nothing. Analysis of accounts by some of the greatest historians of the ancient world could shed new light on this biblical puzzle. They describe a mysterious man-made chemical that would burst into flame without the need for sparks or embers. It was called automatic fire. Automatic fire, as it sounds, is fire that seems to spontaneously ignite. They think of a lot of this is mysterious, supernatural, that there are magical powers at work. Ancient discoveries are investigating the secrets of automatic fire. The story begins nearly 3,000 years ago on Mount Carmel in Israel. According to the Bible, the Israelites had been rejecting Jehovah and worshipping Baal, the god of rain. Now there was only one priest of Jehovah remaining, the prophet Elijah. Elijah went before the people and said, If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal is God, follow him. But the people said nothing. He had to lay down the gauntlet and he said, Come on, bring your prophets of Baal and let's see who the real God is. So Elijah set them a challenge. He and the prophets of Baal would both build altars and call upon their gods to ignite them. He told the prophets of Baal, you build your altar, offer whatever prayers you want, and that's exactly what they did, without any response. The prophets of Baal failed. No fire appeared. Now it was Elijah's turn. He built an altar out of wood. He got the people to dig a furrow going around, to fill it with water. Fill four large jars with water and pour it on the offering and on the wood. Do it again, he said. Do it a third time. And then he prayed to God, save us, answer us our prayers. Fire came out from heaven and consumed the entire area. Elijah had won them back to a belief in God. Fire on an altar drenched with water. Is it possible the water itself somehow actually ignited the blaze? We're used to water putting out fires, but sometimes water can create a fire. What substance could they have had in the ancient world that would display such a supernatural quality? Documents written in Israel in 232 BC harbor clues about the mystical substance automatic fire. There's this man called Julius Africanus who lives in Jerusalem. He talks about this automatic fire. What it probably is, is a mixture of naphtha and sulfur and quicklime. Because this was such a potent thing, the recipes for automatic fire were always very, very closely guarded. And the secret remains hidden again for hundreds of years. Until in the first century AD, the great Roman historians Pliny and Livy both write accounts of this magical mixture igniting with water. Using these accounts and the chemicals they describe, ancient discoveries will attempt to relearn the secrets of automatic fire. Tim Gallagher is the head of chemistry at Bristol University, England. He has been conducting experiments using only substances available in Elijah's time. We have three components, calcium oxide, quicklime, sulfur and naphtha. These are the three components that are mentioned in the ancient texts. Sulfur and naphtha both occur naturally and quicklime comes from burning limestone. We're going to try and create a fire by combining these components and adding water. The easiest way to start a fire with water is to have a reaction that generates a lot of heat and in principle that heat could then ignite something close by that's also flammable. Fires start when a flammable fuel is subjected to heat. When you mix water with quicklime, you generate a lot of heat. The reaction of water with quicklime is highly exothermic. An exothermic reaction is one that releases heat into the atmosphere. This happens because chemical bonds are being formed between the water and the calcium in the quicklime. And what I'm going to do now is cook an egg with the heat that's generated by the quicklime. 
over 500 degrees Fahrenheit now. I didn't think we would generate such a large amount of heat so quickly. If you can harness that heat in the presence of something that will ignite, then you have a way of generating fire with water. But what we don't have in here is anything that will catch fire. So Tim is going to redo this test in the presence of the two fuels, naphtha and sulfur, in the hope that these will ignite from the heat generated. But this experiment will be on a much larger scale. Tim has built a replica of Elijah's altar. So the altar is comprised of 12 large stones, which represented the 12 tribes of Israel. We've added all the quick lime into our little trench. Here we have pieces of rock sulfur. And then the last thing that we'll do, which is the last thing that Elijah did, Elijah poured 12 barrels of water onto his altar. We think that some of that water was naphtha. Naphtha looks just like water, pours just like water, and then we're going to try and ignite that with the heat we generate by adding water to quicklime. The quicklime and water need to raise the ambient temperature past 449 degrees Fahrenheit in order to ignite the sulfur. Once the sulfur is alight, the naphtha and the altar should burst into flame. In Tim's earlier laboratory test, the quicklime reaction reached 527 degrees Fahrenheit. So in theory, this experiment should succeed. But in practice, it hasn't been tried for thousands of years. It's catching. So it's igniting the naphtha. That will spread the fire. And you can see it now spreading through. And everything's coming from the quicklime end of the, the altar. So you can see now the fire is really beginning to build up. It doesn't prove that this is how Elijah created the fire. What it says is this is a possible way that you could have created the fire. The ancients knew about quicklime, they knew about the reaction between quicklime and water, they had naphtha available to them. So certainly this remains a possibility as a way that one could utilize that chemistry knowledge to create a fire using water. People thousands of years ago had an advanced understanding of substances and their reactions. But how they used this knowledge and how much secret wisdom remains lost to science will never be known. Another closely guarded secret of the time was that of one of the earliest biological weapons, a honey that was toxic and was used by ancient armies to poison the enemy. <coughs> Bees, wasps, and hornets strike fear into most of us. Even today, bees kill up to 100 people every year. And in biblical times, military leaders used this fear to terrify enemy armies. In the Bible, if you take all the references to bees, you will notice that some of them present bees as being a danger, as being even a lethal weapon in war. And I will send hornets before you, which shall drive out the Hivite, Canaanite and Hittite from before you. People develop all kinds of ways um, to use bees. They, they pack them into little clay pots, which are almost like hand grenades. Uh, they uh, attach whole hives to catapults and shoot them into cities. But in an ancient account by Greek historian Strabo lies evidence that this weapon was taken one step further. In 67 BC, something happened in the north of Turkey that is still not fully understood by historians. One of the strangest examples of bio-warfare was used against the Roman army. It involved a honey trap of an ingenious nature. There's hugely varied different forms of power struggles going on throughout Roman history. Uh, lots of kings who are very unhappy with their lot and try to rebel. One of these rebellions was led by King Mithridates. He was one of Rome's most successful enemies. He really gives the Romans quite some trouble. The Roman general Pompey the Great was charged with leading a